William Herbert Wallace. This is a true story that can lead people down a rabbit hole, and that's usually what happens. Before you even realise it, you're way down deep in the burrow, passing the signs of, well, this could have happened, maybe so-and-so was involved. Ifs, maybes, and it's possibles are all very well, but it's not going to go anywhere. The only way the culprit would be found now is if a major witness came forward. I doubt that's going to happen. I think they may have all passed away by now. Or that a solution is found that cannot be disputed. At the end of the day, most of us into true crime enjoy a good puzzle. And let's face it, that's what this is. If you look at the case simply and without any confusion, you'll maybe come to the same conclusion as the police. I know I did. But then I went down that bloody rabbit hole. I'm not going to concentrate too much on the findings of the many who have also delved into that rabbit hole. I'm going to try and stick to the basics of the case for now. William Herbert Wallace was born in Cumberland in 1878. He was the oldest of three children. When he left school at 14, he went into an apprenticeship at a draper's in Lancashire. Eventually, after his apprenticeship finished, he moved to Manchester to take a full-time job with Messrs Whiteley, Laidlaw and Company, who were contracted to the British Armed Forces for the making of uniforms and such. He remained in Manchester until 1903, when he transferred to their branch in Calcutta, India. After two years there, he asked for a transfer to Shanghai as his brother lived there and recommended the place to him. William had suffered with a recurring kidney problem for most of his early life and it resulted in him having to move back to England in 1907. His kidney problem would continue throughout his life. He had his left kidney removed at Guy's Hospital. While working for the Liberal Party in Harrogate, he met Julia Dennis and they married in 1914. Julia apparently was the daughter of an alcoholic farmer who lost everything. Something she was allegedly embarrassed about as she told everyone she met that her father was a vet, but her mother was French. Apparently, it was just her and her father when he died in 1875, as she was left an orphan at the age of 13. Now, Julia's age, as a lot of people confused, it was widely believed that Julia was around the same age as William, but it turned out, after her records were discovered in the early 2000s, that on her original birth certificate, she was actually around 17 years older than William. William became unemployed when World War I started and a job was found for him with the Prudential Assurance Company in Liverpool as an insurance agent who visited homes to collect payments and sell insurance. William also took some part-time work at the Liverpool Technical College, lecturing on one of his hobbies, chemistry, his other hobbies being chess and botany. He was a tall man, six foot two, and very slimly built. He had a tendency to wear clothes that were a little dated, a bowler hat, starched collars and overcoats. This added to him looking older than his 52 years. In 1915, William and Julia moved to 29 Wolverton Street, Anfield, Liverpool, where they often held musical evenings from an accomplished pianist, Julia, and fairly reasonable violinist, William. William was apparently a mild-mannered man and the couple seemed to have a good marriage. It's been said that Julia was a little more reserved than her husband and didn't care much for strangers, but all in all they seemed a well-matched, amiable couple. Julia was a delicate-looking woman who spoke fluent French. She was intelligent and articulate. She had a talent for painting as well as the piano. The mystery would start on January the 19th, 1931, 
and it was a dismal day with thick grey clouds covering the sky, drizzling rain falling for most of the evening. At the Cottles City Calf in North John Street, around 6pm, Samuel Beattie had arrived for the evening's chess event. Although most of the members wouldn't arrive until at least 7.30, he always liked to arrive early to make sure everything was ready. Inside the building, between the door and the public telephone, there was a notice board where the chess club details were shown. Beatty went about his business of setting the tables and spoke to the tea lady Gladys Hartley. At 7.20, the public phone rang. Gladys Harley hurried to answer it. The exchange repeated the number bank 3581. Gladys acknowledged the number. The exchange replied, Anfield calling you. There was a pause while she thought someone was having a conversation in the background about two pennies. Eventually, she was put through to a man who asked her if Mr Wallace was there. She wasn't sure if Wallace was a member, so placing down the receiver, she went to find out. She asked Mr Beatty if a Mr Wallace was there, as there was a phone call for him. He looked all around and replied that he was due to play a match, but wasn't there yet and wasn't sure if he would turn up. Beatty decided he'd better talk to the person on the phone to see if he could take a message. Beatty informed the man that Wallace wasn't there yet and wasn't sure if he would turn up. Apparently, William was prone to not always showing up, telling his friend of eight years, Mr Beatty, that he didn't like to leave his wife alone at night and he hadn't been to the chess club since before Christmas. He advised the man to ring back later, to which the caller replied that he couldn't possibly as he was busy it was his daughter's 21st and he wanted to talk about some insurance for her with Mr Wallace. With Mr Wallace specifically. He then asked, would you ask him to call around my house tomorrow evening at 7.30? Beatty responded that he would if he saw him and if he didn't turn up he would try and get the message to him through a friend. The name Mr Qualtro was given. Address, 25 Men of Gardens East, Mosley Hill. William did arrive, a little dishevelled, as he knew the match needed to start by 7.45. He looked around, but his partner for the match was nowhere to be seen. A friend and neighbour stood beside him and asked if he'd like a game. William explained that if it wasn't for the tournament, he'd have stayed at home with his wife as she'd been ill with the flu and he himself had been sick too. William saw a man he needed to play from a missed tournament match and they decided to catch up by playing that night. Beatty, on learning that William was there, suddenly remembered the message. Beatty relayed the message to William who looked puzzled stating that he didn't know anyone by the name Qualtro. He copied the details down in his diary exactly as Beatty had written them. He asked if anyone knew where this was but they couldn't help. So undeterred William knew he could find it himself. That night he left the club happy as he won his match. He caught the tram with his neighbour and another club member. When William and the neighbour got off the tram, they discussed the message and they talked about the best way to get to the address he had been given. When they reached their stop, they walked down the roads and after William had left his neighbour, he carried on through the alleyways to his road and house. The Day of the Murder On Tuesday the 20th of January, the morning was dark and dismal. William left home for work at 10.30am. He had a lot of calls to make on that day, but the area he was headed was known to him. He liked it there. He liked the people. They were mostly good people. He had become friends with his customers and they all seemed to like him. He made his way back home at 2pm for lunch, which he ate with Julia. After a nap, he noted the weather changed and changed his outer coat to a lighter one, leaving his Macintosh at home, hung in the hallway. 
He left the house at just after 3 p.m. His first afternoon visit at 3.20 was a young housewife, Mrs Harrison. They shared a joke and laughed as he said goodbye. At 3.30, William was seen by a police officer cycling down Maiden Lane. PC James Rothwell recognised Wallace as he had been collecting the insurance money from his family home for two years. The PC was said to have commented a few days later that Wallace had been dabbing his eyes as if he'd been crying. He commented that he looked haggard and drawn and very distressed. William went on to do all his usual visits according to all his clients. He seemed his usual self. On one occasion when asked later, the person he visited at 3.30 that day said it wasn't uncommon for Mr Wallace to wipe his eyes with his handkerchief and showed no signs of having been crying. Meanwhile, back at the Wallace home, Amy Wallace, William's sister-in-law, married to his younger brother Joseph, called round to see if Julia would like to go with her to the Empire Theatre to see Mother Goose. Julia said she didn't feel well enough yet to go out. Amy asked how William was. Julia told her he was working late that night and told of his intended late evening appointment that night in Calderstones. At 4.30, the young baker's boy, Neil Norbury, took a delivery to Mrs Wallace. When he saw her, he thought she didn't look well, but she told him it was just a cold, smiled at him and went back inside. William's visits went on as usual. All that had any dealings with him that day all said the same thing, that he seemed his normal, pleasant self. One of his last visits was to a Mrs Margaret Martin on Eastman Road, where he helped with the surrender of her policy form. The time couldn't be determined here. She could only remember that it was sometime between 5.30 and 5.50. William made his way home and it's assumed he reached home around just after 6pm. Nobody saw or heard anything from either William or Julia for an hour and one minute. What happened in those 61 minutes, well that is a question people are still trying to answer. For now let's look at William's movements. William says he left home at 6.45. And at six minutes past seven, William was two miles away from his home, waiting for a tram. The first tram that came along was a number four. William asked the conductor if it would take him to Menlo Gardens East. He explained to the conductor that he wasn't familiar with the area and he had an important appointment there. The conductor told him they didn't go there, but to stay on the tram as he was about to get off and they would drop him at Penny Lane. Yes, that Penny Lane. As the conductor went on to collect fares, William once again reminded the conductor to let him know where to get off from Menlove Gardens East. A ticket inspector got on, and William once again asked him where he should get off the tram for Menlove Gardens East. He told William to get off at Penny Lane and get a number 5A tram. Maybe he was just anxious, but once again, and for the fourth time, he asked to be told where he should get off for Menlove Gardens East. At last, the tram reached Penny Lane, and the conductor called out, Penny Lane, change here for Menlove Gardens. Believe me, I know this seems drawn out, but it is actually relevant. A 5A tram was just pulling up, and William rushed to catch it. It was now 7.15pm and he once again asked this conductor to let him know when they reached Menlove Gardens East. After a short journey, he was told that they had reached Menlove Gardens West and he could find where he was looking for around there. Getting off the tram, he thanked them and once again told the conductor he wasn't familiar with this area. William wandered around the area looking for the address. He allegedly spoke to at least seven people, asking if they could help him find the address. 
a young man informed him that there was no such address. So William decided to try Men Love Gardens West, in case the address had been written down wrong. An elderly woman answered the door to William and informed him he was at the wrong address and couldn't help him with the place he was looking for. He bumped into a policeman and again asked if he knew where the said address was. The policeman, PC James Sargent, told him there was a men love gardens west, north and south, but no east. He had a conversation with PC Sargent explaining everything about the message he had received. The sergeant suggested he try Menlove Avenue. As he walked away, he asked the PC if it was 8pm yet by his watch, or, as his said, 7.45. The PC answered, he was right, it's 7.45. And William walked away. After talking to the local woman and the newsagents, and once again being told there was no such address, and they had never heard of the name Qualtro, he gave up and headed home. At 8.45, Mr and Mrs Johnston were leaving their home for a night out. As they left through their back door and went through their gate into the entry, their neighbour, William, came running past them and ran into his yard through his gate, which was already open. Mr Johnston said hello, but a worried sounding William asked if they had heard anything unusual that night as he couldn't get in his front door or the back kitchen door as they were both locked and his key wouldn't work. He mentioned that he'd been out since 6.45 and he knew his wife wouldn't have gone out as she wasn't well. The time is relevant, in fact it's important. The prosecution said that if Wallace committed the murder, it must have been between 6.30 and 6.50. Let's not forget, the conductor of the tram said Wallace boarded the tram 6 minutes past 7 and 10 minutes past 7. Also, a young delivery boy, who would be the last person to see Julia Wallace alive, states he called at the Wallace home with milk and he spoke to Mrs Wallace this was around 6.30. Mr Johnson suggested he try the back door again while they waited with him to make sure all was well. William went to the door and oddly it opened. He apparently looked confused. While they waited outside, Mrs Johnston noted that she had seen a dim light coming from the middle bedroom and the bathroom. She heard William call out his wife's name before the dim light got brighter. She then noticed a match being struck in the small room William apparently used for one of his hobbies, set up like a laboratory. After a couple of minutes, a distressed William came out and gasped, Come and see, she has been killed. They ran into the house and continued into the parlour. Mrs Johnston noted a spent match on the floor. They saw Mrs Wallace lying in front of the fireplace between two easy chairs that sat either side of the fire. Julia's head was laying in a pool of blood from the many blows she'd suffered to the back and side of her head. The walls and furniture covered with splashes of her blood. Mrs Johnston comforted Wallace and they both stepped into the room. Wallace repeating over and over, they finished her, they finished her. They checked the body to see if she could possibly still be alive. Unfortunately, she was gone. Mr. Johnston hurried to get the police and at Wallace's request, a doctor. A Macintosh was noticed by a sobbing Wallace. It seemed to be under her body. He then realised it was his own coat and thought Julia had maybe placed it over his shoulders as if she was cold. According to Mrs Johnston, Wallace sat mumbling and crying whilst rocking in the chair. Mrs Johnston, an observant woman, looked around the room taking in what she could. She realised if this had been a burglary, Julia's handbag hadn't been touched. Did it go wrong? Apparently, the area had recently been plagued by a spate of burglaries. 
the police arrived. Before going into the possible reason behind why the police maybe made some big mistakes, I'll carry on with what happened. When the police arrived, Mrs Johnston tried to open the front door but couldn't. Wallace took over and opened the door. He stated as saying she couldn't open it because it was bolted. This we don't know if true or not. PC Williams, the first to arrive, inspected the body. Unfortunately, when Mr Wallace made his first of many statements, the PC didn't make a note of it straight away. It was an hour and a half later when he noted. At 6.45 I left the house in order to go to Menlo Gardens and my wife accompanied me to the backyard door. She walked a little way down the alley with me, then she returned and bolted the backyard door. She would then be alone in the house. I went to Menlo Gardens to find the address which had been given to me was wrong. Becoming suspicious, I returned home and went to the front door. I inserted my key to find it could not open it. I went round to the back door. It was closed but not bolted. I went up the back yard and tried the door, but it would not open. I again went to the front door but this time found the door bolted. I hurried round the back and went up the back yard again. I tried the door and this time I found it would open. I entered the house and this is what I found. PC Williams, accompanied by Wallace, went upstairs to look through the house. The PC advised Wallace not to disturb anything. When he noticed the money he kept in a small pot was still there. After looking around, he noted that nothing had been disturbed except in one bedroom. It looked as though the bed covers had been moved. Nothing seemed at first to be missing downstairs either. When asked in court, the PC told of how calm Wallace had been throughout that time. Eventually, Police Sergeant Joe Breslin arrived to take over from the PC. They discussed the Macintosh that, as Wallace told them, was his, but it actually hung in the hallway. Professor John McFall arrived to examine the body. Apparently, the professor had some traits of his own, a very abrupt course man who liked to partake in smoking opium, as apparently. After just a few minutes, he concluded that Mrs Wallace had been dead for at least four hours. Now, if Julia's body had lay there for four hours, then William Wallace's story was complete lies, as that that time would make her death occur before 6pm. There were more important factors the professor had missed, and some that hadn't apparently been taken into account. Don't forget the delivery boy statement. This statement was looked at by D.S. Moore, but he claimed the boy must have been mistaken. McFall examined the room further, coming to the conclusion she had been struck from behind while possibly sitting on one of the fireside chairs. Detective Superintendent Herbert Moore, head of the CID, turned up, asked if William or the Johnstons had noticed anybody strange hanging around the house. They responded they hadn't and more left. The superintendent arranged a search of local places where people would hang out like calves, lodging places, looking for someone with bloodstained clothes. Detective Inspector Herbert Gold arrived at the house along with DS Harry Bailey. The discussion turned to William Wallace's demeanour. Although D.I. Gold knew William from him collecting insurance payments from him, they all found his calm nature unusual considering the circumstances. While searching the house, D.S. Moore found it unusual that nothing had been taken and that a thief had only taken the cash from the cash box in the cabinet, looked in the pot, saw the cash, then replaced the lid and put it back in the place it had been. If it was a burglary, they usually make more of a mess. The house didn't look disturbed at all. They checked the front door, trying the key, 
There was a problem with the lock, but they managed to open it fine. Let's not forget, they also said it was bolted. Sergeant Bailey looked around the parlour. He saw the Macintosh had been burnt on the bottom right, but the rug also had burn marks. He first assumed, like I did, that it was from the gas fire. Wallace, when questioned by Moore, admitted the mat was his, but it hadn't been burnt. McFall discovered a small clot of blood inside the toilet. They couldn't determine how it had got there. It would also come out later that it could have come from the many police officers or even McFall himself. Even so, they would use this against William. Convinced it had come from the murderer, McFall's next step was to check the rest of the bathroom as he thought the murderer had washed himself after, but he found no other evidence. McFall examined the rest of the house for blood, but didn't find any trace. Dr Hugh Pierce, the medical examiner, arrived just before midnight. Floodlights were used to help the police search the windows and doors. They couldn't find any forced entry. Wallace left the house with the police, while the rest of the police continued their investigation at the house. At the station, William was examined. There was no trace of blood on him or his clothes at all. In his statement, he was asked if Mrs Wallace would let someone into the house. He replied she wouldn't if she didn't know them. He was asked if he heard anyone in the house. He replied he thought they might have been because he couldn't open the doors. When asked if he knew if his wife had any money, he replied he didn't know. Lastly, he was asked who knew he was going to the chess club the night before. He replied he hadn't told anyone. When Julia's body was being removed from the house, burn marks were found on her skirt. They had determined that the hot clays on the fireplace had caused the burn marks on the mat, so seeing the skirt burn marks made them a good indication that she'd fallen forward onto the fire. When her clothes were examined, it looked as though she had been grabbed by the neck of her jumper as if it was torn on the left side. The items removed from the house was looked at and it was noted that one of the pound notes taken from the pot had a smear of blood on it. The police suspicions were 1. The murder being someone unknown touching it 2. The husband had murdered her and touched it, then decided not to take it 3. The blood from Mr Wallace after he had touched his wife could have transferred to the money when he went with the officer to check the house. 4. It could have already been on the note. Over the days, the suspicion of Wallace grew, but mostly because of his, as they said, cool manner. But according to close friends and family, it hadn't been any different to usual. His sister-in-law commented that she saw the usually calm man crying and in distress, as you would expect. The police search spread over Anfield through the night, looking for a sign of a person with blood on their clothes. The search was fruitless. The investigation turned up a charwoman who had helped Mrs Wallace for a while. She went with the police to the house to help them distinguish if anything had gone missing. She stated that a large piece of rusted iron, about a foot long and the thickness of a candlestick, and was usually kept in the kitchen fireplace, was gone. Wallace was also taken to the house to see if he noticed anything missing. He couldn't see anything missing. When asked about the iron bar, he responded that he didn't know anything about her bar, but it may have been the poker and maybe Mrs Wallace had gotten rid of it. The search for the poker was scaled down to only the areas where Wallace had caught the trams, where they believed he could have disposed of the bar while allegedly looking for the men lover dress. An intense search of these areas began, but after two days they still hadn't found it. The autopsy results found that Julia Wallace had died from fracture of the skull by someone striking her over the head 11 times using terrific force. An examination of her stomach contents wasn't performed. Apparently, this would have given a better idea of time of death and McFall was convinced she died at 6pm 
meaning that what William had said about returning home just after 6pm and him and his wife had eaten together would have been a lie. The stomach content exam would have proved this either way. If her stomach was empty, this would have proved McFall's theory on the time, pretty important in my book. Tests on the blood found in the toilet turned out to be human blood, but not menstrual. The 14 people with the name Qualtro, who lived in Liverpool, were questioned, but they couldn't help. Eventually, they tried to find where the phone call had been made. DS Moore called the exchange, but they couldn't find such a call made to the CAF that day. After some time, a call came through to inform Moore that they had managed to trace the number to a phone box. The female operator who put the call through remembered it because of the way the caller pronounced the word CAF. He said it like CAFE. And also the caller had had problems with the 2P you needed for the call. He had apparently pressed the wrong button and the operator had to help him with this. They got the call through at 7.20. There wasn't anything unusual about the caller's voice, but it may have sounded like an elderly man. A GPO engineer found the phone box was located between Brett Road and Rochester Road reasonably close to the Wallace's home, making DS Moore even more convinced that Wallace was guilty, but no evidence against him could be found. At the tram, the conductors were interviewed and gave their statements, telling of the questions Wallace had asked and of where he had wanted to go. The only conductor they didn't attempt to find was the one on the tram to the calf the previous night. By now, the murder was big news and reporters had descended on Anfield, looking for some sensationalistic story. Rumours started to spread about Wallace and his sister-in-law that enraged both her and William. But thankfully, they also got the story of the delivery boy and the time he had last seen Mrs Wallace. One paper reporting that it wasn't Julia he'd seen, but the sister-in-law pretending to be her. But the delivery boy knew Mrs Wallace and wasn't mistaken. All the statements were taken from everyone that saw William Wallace that night, and they identified him in a lineup. The thought was that he had made himself noticeable by continuously asking questions of people, so that they'd remember him and establish his alibi. To be honest, that was my first thought. After the young boy Alan Close had told the police he had seen Mrs Wallace around 6.45, Moore wanted to know if William Wallace could have still had time to kill her just after the boy had seen her and catch in the 7.06 tram. A decision was made to do a tram test. Seven detectives would take the same route from the house to the tram. Then the tram to the stop at Smithdown Road, where Wallace got off the tram to continue to Menlo. What they didn't take into account was the waiting time for the tram, and they only timed from the house to Smithdown Road. Whereas they timed Wallace from the house to catching the second tram, making the distance longer and adding a good five minutes more. There was apparently over 20 tram tests done the time varying between 17 to 20 minutes. No matter how hard they tried, it still meant William could not have left the house any later than 6.49pm. A girl claimed to have seen Mr Wallace talking to another man at 8.35, which meant that William had lied about not speaking to anyone and rushed straight home because he had suspicions. This couldn't be proved, despite many appeals for this man to come forward nobody ever did. It was also thought that William had timed his return to coincide with the Johnstons leaving their house so they would be his witness to finding the body. But the Johnstons hadn't made up their minds to go out until much later so Wallace probably wouldn't have even known they were going anywhere. But then he could have guessed or even waited to see if they would.
Wallace had noticed he was followed one night after leaving the station and while waiting for a tram, he bumped into his chess club friends who were adamant he was agitated and very upset, asking Beatty if he could clarify the time he had taken the call for Mr Qualtro. Beatty couldn't help and advised Wallace to be careful what he said as it could be misconstrued. The plainclothes policeman followed him to his sister-in-law's home. After a few days, William was once again back in the police station and questioned about his conversation with Beatty. Why did he ask Beatty about the call? William answered that he had an idea, a thought about the call. Now the police thought he was on the defensive. Why would he tell Mr Beatty the police had cleared him? Why did he think he was indiscreet to mention anything to Mr Beatty? He later explained that he later realised he maybe shouldn't have asked Mr Beatty any questions as he would maybe be a witness. Why did he even think the police suspected him and they certainly hadn't cleared him? The police's point being that if he was innocent he wouldn't even think they suspected him. I mean well come on now. Wallace wasn't a stupid man. He knew right from the start they suspected him. In fact, he was their only suspect. Wallace was followed everywhere he went, and everyone knew it. Rumours began to spread, suggesting Wallace was using his job, collecting insurance money as a way to satisfy his sexual needs, flirting with the ladies while their husbands weren't home, and maybe his wife had found out and he killed her in a fit of rage or he did it for the insurance money. Or maybe, as she suffered a chronic illness, he put her out of her misery. Or his desire to kill someone and killing his wife satisfied his need. Poor Julia Wallace's character began to be questioned. Maybe she had had an affair with a married man and she had threatened to write to his wife when he decided to end the affair and he killed her. The rumour went that a man made the call to the chess calf and when he knew William Wallace would be out of the way, he went to see Julia. They made love in the front bedroom, explaining the disturbance in the bedroom. When going back downstairs while Julia lit the fire, he attacked her. Then while looking for some incriminating letters, he found the cash box and took the money. They were just rumours. There was no evidence pointing to anyone, nobody, and definitely no motive at all. Mr. Joseph Crow, a prudential supervisor who had known William Wallace for over 12 years, told the police of William's character, which he saw as exemplary. He held both William and his wife in very high regard. He saw William as a kindly gentleman and saw Mr and Mrs Wallace as devoted to each other as possible. Now Mr Crewe lived in a house close to Menlove Gardens and William had been to his home when, for the purpose of being taught the violin. He visited on a couple of occasions about two years before this happened. The police took this as Wallace knowing the area so shouldn't have needed directions i.e. if he could find Mr Crewe's address with no problem then he should have been able to find Menlove Gardens easily as it was close to where Mr Crewe's house was situated and should have known there was no Menlove Gardens East not necessarily and why didn't he call at Mr Crewe's house to ask if he knew where the address was or if he had heard of someone called Mr Qualtro well, for one, Mr Crew has specified that he had given William explicit instructions on how to get to his house. Two, he didn't go anywhere near Menlove Gardens as Mr Crew walked with him to his tram stop when he left and the way they walked they had no need to go near the said area. And Wallace never said he didn't know where Menlove Gardens was, just he didn't know where Menlove Gardens East was. Mr Crewe also stated he didn't know if there was a Menlove East, 
When they asked William why he hadn't asked Mr. Crewe for some help, he said he had called at his house. Then why hadn't he stated that to police? Because, he replies, they asked him for the people he had spoken to, and Mr. Crewe hadn't been home, so he hadn't spoken to him. Analyst William Roberts examined all William Wallace's clothes he wore that night and couldn't find any trace of blood except an old spot that was too old to be from that night. But the murderer must have been covered in blood, so how did Wallace manage to leave the house without a trace of blood on him? In the short time he had before catching the tram, asked if the clothes could have been washed, it wouldn't have mattered, that amount of blood would leave a huge trace. Did he have time to clean up, change clothes and dispose of the blood-stained garments on his way to catch the first tram? But the whole of the area had already been searched and there was no sign of anything. Still convinced that William Wallace was guilty, Roberts and Professor McFall thought they had the answer. They came up with Wallace being naked or he wore something over his clothes, and to be fair, I thought that too. But, let's not forget, there was no sign of any blood being washed away. The other theory being that the Macintosh that had been burnt and found under Julia, and was covered in blood on both the inside and outside, had been worn by William Wallace while he killed his wife to protect him from the blood splatter. The fact that the areas on William would have been exposed like his trouser bottoms, shoes, hands and face were apparently ignored. Robertson McFall came up with this theory. After killing his wife, Wallace took off the Mac, then realising that the police would question how it came to be so bloodstained, he decided to destroy it by burning it on the gas fire. He held it on the hot clays for a moment as it began to smoulder and it caught fire. He pulled it away and put out the flames. Why? Maybe he thought the smell would be noticed from the street or he feared the house would burn down. If Wallace had premeditated this whole murder, why would he panic at this point? Apparently, Roberts and McFall covered this with the answer. Murder is an abnormal act, so you don't expect a murderer to behave completely normal. Grasping at this theory, Moore brought the young boy close back into the police station. They were adamant the time was wrong. Eventually, the young boy seemed to remember what happened slightly different, and he thought it may have been earlier that he had seen Mrs Wallace as he noted the time on the church clock just before delivering to the Wallace's home and the clock had said 6.25. After checking the church clock was accurate, the police wanted to establish how long it took the young boy to get to the Wallace's home from the church. Inspector Gold and Sergeant Bailey timed the boy as he retraced his step from the church following his usual delivering milk. It took six minutes for him to arrive at the Wallace's home at 6.31. This, the police had determined, would give Wallace 18 minutes to kill his wife before leaving to catch the tram at 6.49, as well as to get rid of all the evidence and clean up. After days of talks with those higher up in the force, an arrest warrant was produced on Monday the 2nd of February for the arrest of William Wallace for the murder of his wife, Julia. On Tuesday the 3rd, William Wallace was brought before Magistrate Stuart Deacon. Mr Bishop started the statement of the police findings and once the statement had been read, the Magistrate asked Wallace if he had anything to say. William rose to his feet and stated he was innocent of the charge. Wallace secured himself a solicitor, a hard-working young man, Hector Munro, who set about the job of defending his client. After visiting the scene of the crime, he wondered about the last person who had seen Mrs Wallace, the milk boy. After asking the neighbours questions, he came to James Curd, one of the chess members who knew William. 
His son was one of the children who had spoken to the milk boy, Alan Close, the night after the murder. He told Munro about the conversation an excited Close had had with them about being the last person to have seen Mrs Wallace, as he had delivered the milk at 6.45. His story was backed up by a further two children who were also present when he said this. Elsie Wright was adamant the church service bell rang at 6.30. She was there for five minutes. Leaving the vicarage, she passed Alan Close at 6.40 and he was on his way to Wolverton Street where the Wallaces lived. Munro then called at Alison Wildman's home, a 16-year-old paperboy who also saw Alan Close on the doorstep of the Wallaces' house at 22 minutes or 23 minutes to 7. The young man who delivered the evening paper was also found David Jones. He had delivered the paper as usual, pushing the paper through the letterbox at around 6.35. So somebody had picked up the paper as it was found on the kitchen table. So why did Alan Close change his mind? And why deny having told the other children he'd seen Mrs Wallace at 6.45? And why did the police ignore the statements made by Alison Wildman and David Jones and why were they not called as witnesses? Confused? Yep, me too. Monroe became suspicious listening to the statements being put to him, especially when they had all told the police what they knew. Monroe gathered all his statements and witnesses. He maybe felt confident he could disprove most of the evidence against his client in front of a packed courtroom after a battle between Sidney Schofield Allen, Wallace's barrister, and J.R. Bishop for the prosecution at the Magistrates' Court, which was apparently intense, the magistrate allowed Wallace to say something now if he had anything to say. Wallace stood up and pled not guilty to killing his wife. He mentioned how much he and his wife loved each other and would never do anything to harm her. He told of having no reason to do this and there was no evidence against him. He told how he was a broken man, how his wife had been his world and his life was torn apart. He protested again that he was innocent of this terrible crime. The magistrate, Mr Ward, committed Wallace to trial at the Liverpool Spring Assizes. At the trial... With the murder of Julia Wallace and the subsequent arrest of her husband being front page news, the court was packed, as it would be throughout the trial. Roland Oliver was acting as defence for Wallace and the apparently controversial Edward Hemmerd for the prosecution. On April the 13th, the two-week trial began. The judge was Mr Justice Wright. It would seem he was a very busy man as he wanted the trial to be over by the exact time. Hermerd, in his opening speech, using dramatic gestures, swung an iron bar about, saying how easy it would be to get rid of such an item. He then proceeded to skirt past the fact that the whole police search for the weapon was fruitless. More dramatics followed when the Max theory was introduced, his tone of voice turning lower and darker, suggesting Wallace had worn the Mac over his nude body while committing the crime. Witnesses came and went at a remarkable pace, especially when the phone call to the chess club was introduced. Although B2 took the call was adamant it wasn't Wallace's voice he heard. When Alan Close was on the stand, his questioning by the prosecution was over in minutes. When the defence stood, Close became unsettled, couldn't remember seeing the paperboy or Elsie Wright and the others about the time he was there. No, he said he hadn't told them and it wasn't 6.45, he told them between 6.30 and 6.45. So we did mention a time after all. So it wasn't precisely 6.30 and his wavering answers says a lot. 
The Johnston's evidence of the night went well. The question as if the front door was bolted couldn't be answered as Mrs Johnston just didn't know if it was or not. As when she went to the door, she struggled and couldn't open it. Wallace had taken over and managed to open it to the first police officer on the scene, Williams. When Williams was asked if he heard a bolt being drawn, he replied he did not. When asked about Wallace having told him his wife had walked down the entry and then returned to the back door and bolted it, he replied yes sir he did. Apparently what Wallace had actually said was that Julia had walked with him down the yard and then returned to the back door. Whether she bolted the door he wouldn't have known. Williams claimed he had made a rough note but hadn't written down the details told to him straight away. Apparently it was an hour and a quarter later. He added, and I have to say this was my theory after going down the rabbit hole, he did think of the possibility that someone had snuck into the house when Julia went down the yard before returning to the house. A locksmith was brought in to examine the door locks and bolts. It was found that they were rusted slightly and the locks in need of oil as it made the door difficult to open and some pressure was needed to open it. And yet the Johnstons saw Wallace open the back door easily. McFall gave his evidence drawing a picture in the minds of the jury of what he had found. He expressed his findings well putting theories forward. The defence asked him if he agreed that if Julia had stooped to bend down to light the fire and had the coat around her shoulders when struck on the head, she would fall forward and to the side, then the mat would be under her. McFall didn't agree as there was no evidence to prove she had the mat around her shoulders. Asked again if it was possible this had happened, McFall had to reluctantly agree. Asked about the blood and if the person would be covered, even if wearing a mac, the blood would have been over their shoes and hands and face. He had to agree, but it was an assumption. A lot of McFall's examination of the body was criticised by the defence, claiming his lack of taking the temperature of the body and not taking any notes on rigour setting in, led to an inaccurate measure of time of death. Other forensic methods used by McFall were criticised and said to be untrustworthy, but he also, I have to say, had some valid points. On finding a reason why Wallace would do this, i.e. a motive, McFall said he determined that Wallace was mad, and madmen don't need a reason. When asked if he believed Wallace was mad, he suggested that he might have acted up in a moment of frenzy, but could now be sane. McFall would go on to say, after the case, that he believed the milk boy had seen Mr Wallace, dressed as his wife. D.S. Moore put forward his findings on the case, stressing that because there was no blood on Mr Wallace's shoes, it didn't mean he wasn't guilty. In fact, it was more so that he was guilty, as he must have known where the blood was when he went to light the gas. He would have walked in it. An innocent man, he suggested, would have just walked straight in, tripping over the body. Now this is where the spent match came up. Wallace had lit the match at the doorway so he could see his way into the room where he saw his wife on the floor. Gold's evidence went pretty much the same way as Moore's. At the trial, on Saturday, April the 25th, the court was packed. People had queued for hours to get a good place in the court. The judge entered and the court grew silent. Wallace sat in the dock. Both the defence and the prosecution gave their closing speeches. The jury went to consider a verdict. Almost an hour later they returned. When asked for their verdict, the foreman stood and said, guilty. Before sentencing, Wallace calmly spoke, saying, I am not guilty. I cannot say anything else. William Wallace was sentenced to hang. There was a twist in people's views on the case after hearing all the, or should I say, lack of evidence against Wallace. William Wallace's brother, Joseph, his lawyer, Monroe, and a friend, 
started raising funds for the appeal. Munro and Schofield put in an appeal on these grounds. 1. The verdict was unreasonable and cannot be supported with regard to the evidence. The whole of the evidence was consistent with Wallace's innocence and the prosecution never discharged the burden of proving that he and no one else was guilty. 2. The judge at the conclusion of the evidence should have withdrawn the case from the jury. 3. Misstatements were made by the prosecution in the opening speech. 4. No motive was suggested by the prosecution. 5. A great feature was made that Wallace's demeanour on the 20th of January was cool, calm and indifferent. No such suggestion was made at the police court, though all the same witnesses were examined. 6. An effort was made to suggest that the mat was worn by the assailant. 7. Professor McFall forced upon the court the suggestion that this was a crime of frenzy, thus supplying the jury with a reason for the commission by Wallace of the murder. 8. Wallace was prejudiced by the fact that the Crown failed to call as witnesses for the prosecution Wildman and Jones to supply the defence with copies of all the statements taken from persons who were not called at the police court. 9. The judge in his summing up misdirected the jury by saying that if there was no motive for Wallace there was no motive for anyone else. 10. On the occasions of the speeches by the prosecuting solicitor at the Liverpool City Police Court, the said prosecuting solicitor made a number of misstatements as to the evidence and case for the prosecution, which said statements were reported in extenso and widely circulated throughout Liverpool and surrounding districts, and which, although in the end disposed of, were nevertheless prejudicial. On Monday the 18th of May, the appeal started. Once again the court was packed. The judges of appeal, the Lord Chief Justice of England, Lord Hewitt, Mr Justice Branson and Mr Justice Hawke, Roland Oliver speaking for Wallace and Edward Hemmerd for the Crown. After lengthy speeches from both sides that lasted for two days, Lord Chief Justice Hewitt spoke. In his drawn-out speech, he said the conclusion to which we have arrived is the case against the appellant, which we have carefully considered, was not proved with certainty, which is necessary in order to justify a verdict of guilty. The result is that this appeal will be allowed, and this conviction quashed. William Wallace was released, and after a torrent of hate aimed towards him when he returned home to the house he had shared with his wife, he decided it was best for him to move. He found a bungalow in the Wirral, only five miles away from Liverpool. Apparently the rumours never stopped. Even people he thought were his friends shunned him, making Wallace's life even more miserable. Already grieving his wife's death, he became more and more depressed. Wallace, it's thought, had had enough, and by 1933, after being rushed to hospital, he passed away on the 26th of February. OK, let's look at some points. One, there was no motive. Two, the idea it was a fit of frenzy was brought in because of lack of evidence or motive. Three, no evidence to prove Wallace made the phone call. Four, there was no time for Wallace to kill his wife, clean up before leaving for Menl of Gardens. 5. No sign of murder weapon, even after an extensive search. 6. Prosecu prosecution asked why wouldn't the person who called and left the message take the opportunity to go to the house that night as they seemed to know William would be at the chess club. 7. How would the person know he'd be at the club if no one knew for sure he would turn up to get the message? 8. Something I thought. How did the person Qualtro know Wallace even attended the chess club? 
9. When getting off the tram, why didn't he ask the policeman where Men Love Gardens East was? Why make a point of asking so many people questions of where he wanted to go? Could be creating an alibi. A man who he doesn't know rings up about business and expects him to go to a place he's not familiar with. And then, without knowing if Wallace has gone to the place, goes to his house and waits for a chance to murder Mrs. Wallace. Why? No proof the doors were bolted. Defence witnesses kept to their statements. Prosecution tried to discredit the times the young witnesses had seen Alan and Mrs. Wallace. The witnesses who saw William Wallace before he returned home said he was his usual self. As Crown Counsel, her murder should have presented the known facts of the case as accurately, impartially and without appealing to the emotions of the jury. He also, apparently, hid evidence that would have helped the defence and attempted to elicit from witnesses evidence which he knew to be untrue. There was no evidence of the murder weapon that the police had searched extensively for. And in 1930s, a worker fitted a new fire at 29 Wolverton Street, checked under a small gap behind the fireplace, and in that gap he found an iron bar. When he checked it, he didn't see any traces of blood on it, but he handed it over to the police, and apparently it went missing. So who did it? Without a doubt, it was premeditated by someone. There's so many questions, too many. There's also a Mr X, and what do you know, a mystery man. Apparently, a man known to Wallace. Wallace made a list of 15 people Mrs Wallace would admit into the house. Gold had asked Wallace if he suspected any of the people on the list. Wallace remembered one, a colleague, that had called at his house to leave a letter with his wife, and had called a couple of times after. He knew Wallace's movements, as he had also attended the chess club and often had lunch there. He knew where Wallace had kept the cash box. Mr X had covered for Wallace while he was ill, but had taken money from his clients and not paid it into his employers. It was Wallace who discovered the discrepancies in the accounts and pointed it out to Mr X. Gold took a statement from Mr X and found he allegedly had an alibi. It will be discovered later that the person who had given an alibi had lied for him, telling Wallace's lawyer Mr X had showed up later than first stated, so after 9pm. He was a suspect, but this was for some reason ignored. But apparently he did have other alibis who saw him from around 5.30 to 8.30. Wallace apparently looked into Mr X himself when he was released and found out that he was struggling financially. He was in debt to friends and had a police record. In fact, he had quite the record for theft, embezzlement and indecent assault. I know the name of Mr X, it's Richard Parry. <laughs> but I found the term Mr X way more intriguing. Apparently a troubled young man, who, although had witnesses, also had some that believe he did it. A 24-year-old John Parks left home for a short walk down a back entry on his way to his nighttime job at the Atkinson's garage and taxi business. He knew the local police officer on the beat who told him about the murder. He had known of Wallace through the man he knew as Parry. Now apparently, according to Parks, Parry came to the garage in the early hours of that night and demanded he hose down his car, inside and out. According to Parks, he seemed agitated when Parks opened the door of the car and saw a glove covered in blood. Parry apparently said to Parks, if the police see this, he will hang. He then proceeded to tell him he had disposed of an iron bar down the grate outside of a doctor's. Parks believes Parry was washing away what he had done, even wearing waders, having borrowed a fisherman's oilskins from a neighbour. 
Parks didn't know what to do, so he asked his boss, who advised him to stay out of it. But if Wallace was arrested, they would tell the police what they knew. Keeping their word, when Wallace was arrested, they told the police all they knew about Parry. The police allegedly thought they were mistaken. It wasn't until Wallace himself put Parry's name forward that they searched both his house and car. They also checked his alibis. Whoever it was, I feel Julia let them in. Why, I don't know. I suspect we will never know. As the police never identified another suspect for the murder of Julia Wallace. The case was left open and unsolved.